Welcome. My name is Philip Belts. I'm the director of the Jenks Center. And I want to thank everyone for coming this evening for this is the 19th annual Bren. Um, it's a Jenks tradition, the Brennan Lecture. And as I said, this was um, established by the Brennan family, and this is the 19th. Um, we're very fortunate to have um, a Winchester resident, um, Dr. Robert Legbold, as our speaker this evening, who received his PhD from Tufts University, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and is the Marshall Schumann Professor Emeritus in the Department of Political Science at Columbia University, where he specialized in international relations of the post-Soviet states. He was director of the Harriman Institute, Columbia University, and previously served as senior fellow and director of Soviet Studies Project at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. For, for most of the preceding decade, he was on the faculty of the Department of Political Science at Tufts University. He is currently co-director of the project, Meeting the Challenges of a Nuclear Age, at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Legko's areas of particular interest are the foreign policies of Russia, Ukraine, and other new states of the former Soviet Union, United States relations with post-Soviet states, and the impact of post-Soviet region on the international po politics of Asia and Europe. He has authored numerous books and scholarly articles. Um, he's a Winchester resident since 1971. Bob and his wife, Gloria, who many of you know from the Multicultural Network, um, they have two children, Nancy and Nathan. Um, Gloria and Bob, both from South Dakota, dated in high school and later married in their sophomore years. And um, they came to Winchester in 1971. And despite his residency in Winchester, um, Dr. Legbo commuted between Boston and New York City for 30 years that he taught at Columbia. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Legbo. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be with all of you tonight, in particular, uh, particularly to have the opportunity to give um, a lecture which honors a woman, Mary Brennan, who gave so much to the Winchester community as a school teacher, as a civic activist, as a deeply engaged uh, member of her Catholic faith. The topic tonight is U.S.-Russia relations, and in the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to go about it by addressing uh, four questions. The first question is, what has happened to the U.S.-Russia relationship, and where is it likely to go? The second is, since all of us in this room know that the relationship is in bad shape and going badly, uh, what, does, what kind of a challenge does that pose for the United States? What kind of a threat is Russia to the United States? Then the third question that I'll have something to say about is, does it really matter? Does it really matter that relations are in the condition they are today? After all, Russia is scarcely the Soviet Union. And then the last fourth question, because I think it does matter, uh, what should be done about it in the uh, circumstances? Um, a warning, when it comes to the last three questions, beginning with um, uh, the second question, the nature of the threat, uh, my answer does not fall into the mainstream. It's not in the mainstream that we have in among the political world within Washington or within the media, uh, or even within much of the expert community. Um, First, however, let me turn to that first question of what's happened to U.S.-Russia relations, what is happening today, and where do they appear to be headed. I think something fundamental and dramatic has happened in U.S.-Russia relations. It has, uh, the relationship has since the Ukrainian crisis in 2014, gone over the cliff. It's very different from the 20 years after the Soviet Union collapsed and the Cold War ended. That was a period of time where I would describe the relationship as essentially neither fish nor fowl. Uh, the two countries were not certain whether we were pro or friend. There were instances of trouble. There were other moments of hope. But for the most part, we hoped it was friendship and that we would gain traction and it would continually move in that direction. But in the context of the Ukrainian crisis, the relationship has now gone over the cliff. 
and into what I call a new Cold War. The last little book that I wrote two years ago was called Return to Cold War. It's not the original Cold War. It's fundamentally different. That's obvious. Uh, it uh, does not engulf or encompass the entire international system. There are important players that aren't part of it. China's not part of it. India, probably a majority of countries are not part of this essentially Rus Russia West, Russia U.S. Cold War. Secondly, it is not driven by a fundamental ideological animus, capitalism versus communism. And third, at least up to this point, it's not waged under the shadow of nuclear Armageddon. It is possible we move in that direction, but that's not where we are right now. So it's fundamentally different. But in several key respects, it's respects, it's very much like the original Cold War, and alas, the early years of that Cold War from the Berlin blockade in 1948 until shortly after Stalin's death in 1953. Uh, let me identify some of those characteristics. Then, as now, each side blamed and today blames the other side almost exclusively for what's gone wrong. And it's not merely that each side blames the other entirely for what's gone wrong. It's uh, as a result of the behavior of the actions of the other side. We blame each side, each side blames the other because of what the other side is, what the nature of the other side is. I call that seeing the essence of the problem as in the essence of the other system. Secondly, when we today, as in that period 48 to 53, maybe a little after that, think about the problem in the relationship, it's not just a conflict of interests over Ukraine or Syria or election interference. It's an assumption on both sides, Moscow looking at the US, the US looking at Russia, a conflict of purpose, of fundamental purpose, which makes it a much deeper uh, confrontation in those circumstances. Third, as in that early period of the original Cold War today, the assumption is nothing is going to change fundamentally until there's fundamental change on the other side. Either it collapses, which was the basis ultimately of our containment policy of the Soviet Union and its assumption, or there is a fundamental change in the nature of the regime, its character, its configuration, or its orientation and what it's doing. And uh, fourth, that this um, relationship is capable only of producing one-off moments of cooperation. We get an, an Iran deal with Russian cooperation, of which the United States has now withdrawn. Uh, or we were able to cooperate in uh, attempting to, and to some extent, succeed in removing chemical weapons from Assad's arsenal in Syria or in other areas. But these are, as I've said, one-off. There's nothing cumulative about the steps, the progress. In fact, each little step is then buffeted and undermined by negative trends or the unexpected event that comes along. As a result, the relationship is seen as limited to something that's purely transactional without, as I say, cooperation that can be cumulative that changes the nature of the relationship. There's no hope, as there was not in that 48 to 53 period, that any time soon U.S.-Russia relations can change but for, as I've said, that notion that there has to be fundamental change on the other side. And you'll notice I continually put this in terms of a mutual relationship where the attitudes are the same in Moscow as they are in the U.S. On these, at, this, uh, at this structural level. Uh, second, then uh, the, the second question is what kind of a threat in these circumstances of what I call this new Cold War? What kind of a challenge is Russia in the circumstances? Is it, is it a fundamental and a vital challenge and threat to the United States? Or is it merely nettlesome, an annoyance, which is very relevant to that third question. Does it really matter that we are in a new Cold War with Russia? Does it really matter, given that Russia is not the Soviet Union? I warned you that, um, that my answers to these questions uh, is not, does not correspond to uh, mainstream thinking. Uh, 
uh, along these lines. Uh, and uh, therefore, if I were to characterize the mainstream before I, uh, before I share with you my own view of these things, I would say that uh, the interpretation is rather like a, uh, a Mondrian painting with sharp lines and with bright primary colors. Uh, the general perception in Washington, and it has its parallel in Moscow, within the media, which you watch each evening, or the newspapers that you read, or within the expert community, is that the challenge, the threat from Russia, is stark, it's direct, and it's severe. The assumption is, by and large, that Russia, under Putin, is committed to destroying a rules-based international order, and you hear that from politicians and journalists regularly, and in the process, destroying a European order, and that's the reason for the aggression in Ukraine, and it's prepared to commit the same kind of aggression elsewhere. Secondly, that this Russia under Putin, with the Mondrian portrait or painting, uh, as a version of what's going on, is a country that's committed to undermining the U.S. international position wherever and whenever it can. Uh, and it's prepared to do that in several ways. First of all, by mobilizing hostile forces to U.S. policy, whether it's opposition within our country or within our democratic allies, or by mobilizing the disaffected countries around the world that are opposed to the U.S., Iran, uh, now Venezuela, and a number of other along the same line, that this Russia, in attempting to undermine the U.S. international position, is committed to and busily working at undermining U.S. alliances, fragmenting U.S. alliances, creating problems in that transatlantic alliance, or in the U.S.-Japanese relationship or otherwise. That Russia, as part of this process, is in the business of reinserting itself militarily, reinserting itself militarily in the Arctic, or reinserting itself militarily in Syria, or even in small portion within Venezuela today. That's, that is, as I've said, the dominant view, the mainstream view, and as I said, I'm not part of that. Uh, my view is, that, uh, is closer to the characterization of the, the fine uh, French writer, Andre Gide. Andre Gide once said, the color of truth is gray. The color of truth is gray. So on a simple question that gets answered in one way by the Mondrian perception, is it, is it Putin's Russia that we're dealing with, or is it Russia's Putin? That's what's causing what. And the Mondrian view says it has to be one or the other, and you can pick your choice between the two. Gide's advice, the color of truth is gray, says that it's both. It's both at that level. And in terms of, uh, in terms of the uh, characterization of the threat itself, the argument would be uh, that the challenge, the threat, is complex. It's significant, it's real, it's a problem, and it's one that has to be addressed by U.S. foreign policy, but the Russian challenge or the threat that Russia poses, the view would be, it's my view, is a function of the circumstances in which Russia finds itself and the events that it's subject to, and therefore it's malleable. It is subject to the influence and the effect of our behavior and of our policy toward Russia. Uh, and uh, it, it shows up in, a, in the characterization in a different way. Dmitry Trenin, who is one of the finest Russian analysts in Moscow, the Carnegie Moscow Center, makes the argument that Putin's Russia is not committed to undermining the European order, whatever you think of uh, the significance of the Ukrainian crisis and what's happened since. Uh, Putin's Russia is committed to destroying, yes, the post-Cold War international order. But the post-Cold War international order is, in his mind and that of his colleagues and much of the Russian elite, an international order which is controlled by the United States in which the United States chooses to use military power when and where without regard for its consequences or significance for others. And that post-Cold War order, which we've seen over the years as being unipolarity, but has permitted the United States to play the role in international politics is indeed uh, 
a, a characterization of international politics that the Russians are prepared to undermine. Secondly, uh, with this more complex view of what motivates the Russians and creates the challenge that they are for us, is a perception that U.S. policy is in pursuit, I think it's a misperception, but that U.S. policy is in pursuit of a grand strategy of regime change again, whenever, wherever, and by whatever means it suits its purpose without consideration of its consequences elsewhere. That it began with the Iraq War, that it extended to Libya, and then to Syria, and then to Ukraine, and ultimately Ukraine and regime change to serve our purposes directed at Russia itself and regime change within Russia. Third, I would characterize the complex nature of the Russian challenge as one that comes from a leadership and a leader, in particular Putin, who believes in the right of Russia to great power status. The, uh, there is a, there's a concept in Russian that's very hard to translate a word into English. It derives from the Russian word for great power. Uh, or for power, Dirjava is the Russian word. But there is a noun that then flows from it that is hard for me to translate in a way that will be meaning for you. It's Dirjavnust. <coughs> Dirjavnust. Dirjavnust, if it were translated literally, means great poweredness. It's not a new, it's not a new idea. I've traced the, the idea back to the ninth century, back to Kiev and Rus, and it shows up at moments of great transition and instability where Russia's identity, role, and place in international politics is uncertain question. But it's essentially an argument that Russia is and must be entitled to great power status, whether it has the wherewithal, whether it has the basis for that or not. Uh, and uh, as I say, one of, the, one of the, I think, one of the motivating or characteristics or impulses for Russian foreign policy is this determination to be treated respected uh, and acknowledged as a great power and have all of the prerogatives of great power status. And if we're not prepared to offer that, then they're prepared to impose it on us. And do so by, here's the challenge and the threat, by methods and by actions that are unacceptable and that are disruptive and dangerous, including what was done in Crimea, including what they're doing within eastern Ukraine and Donbass. Even the way they've gone about the support for the Syrian regime in Syria and what they may be prepared to do in other ways. But the argument here, the reason for Jid, the color of truth is gray, is if we're going to deal with it effectively, we have to understand the impulses or the motivations that are driving it in the first place. And when we get that wrong, as we are today, then we're not effective in dealing with what is a genuine problem in foreign policy. Does it, does it, that leads then to the third question, does it really matter? After all, as I've said now twice before, Russia is not the Soviet Union. Its GDP is one thirteenth the size of the United States. Uh, its defense budget is one-tenth that of the United States. Now let's see if I can get this to work. There you have the comparison. That's the U.S. defense spending in the next seven countries of which our defense spending is larger than the next seven. But Russia, all these instruments up here, Russia is here. They're not even in the top five. So does it? Does it, really, does it really matter in these circumstances? Uh, and that in the context of the world of threats that we deal with. After all, there is the rise of China and a China that looks as though in its relationship with the United States is moved, moving in the direction of hostility, potential competition, uh, and will be the other major power in the 21st century. Secondly, a world in which Democracies, including our own, are in some disarray and some dysfunction. Is that not a more important security problem than a Cold War with Russia? Given what I've just said, one-thirteenth the size of our GDP, one-tenth the size of our defense budget. Um, a, um, 
an environment in which we could be sliding toward a war over North Korea with nuclear implications. Aren't all of those more important at this point when you think about priorities of security threats? Uh, in this context, Russia then emerges as a strange combination of a country that is weak at one level, but noxious at another level, a troublemaker in international politics. So what do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? You deal with it by drawing red lines, by punishing it, and regularly with a new wave of sanctions, or by building up your defenses, your military defenses, your defense budget as such. But in this context, what has happened since the Ukrainian crisis and the going over the cliff into new Cold War, from my point of view, is generally treated, it won't be said this way, but it's generally treated in almost all circles, Washington, media, and so on, as affordable wreckage. Affordable wreckage. Necessary uh, in the circumstances, but something that we can afford, the international community can afford along the way. I think it's the wrong framework, this notion of a weak but noxious power because of the material factors that I've cited. Uh, it's characteristic of my academic colleagues in political science and international relations theory to stress the material, the balance of power, and where a country stands within that balance of power, uh, the issues of polarity, bipolarity, multipolarity. This is clearly not a Russia that is, even if the world's moving in a multipolar direction, that's going to be one of the critical poles in the circumstance. Uh, but I think, as I said a moment ago, this is the wrong framework. I think we need to move from uh, my political science and academic context with the emphasis on material factors and distribution of power, balance of power, to uh, the real estate agent standard. The real estate answer, sta agent standard is three things. Location, location, location. Take a look at that location. Take a look at the parts of the world that we care about at this point. An Islamic world in flames, generating the risk of catastrophic terrorism. A rising China and the potential tensions around South China Sea, always Taiwan. Uncertainties over this narrow territory within Europe that is neither in NATO nor any longer within the uh, control or the yoke of the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, which then affects Western Europe. What country, what landmass is likely to be more important in what happens in all of those, in all of those areas? So that's one way. The second, the second uh, way in which I think about uh, the answer to this question of does it matter, does it really matter, uh, is the core of what I have to say to you tonight. And that is the stakes in U.S.-Russia relations. I believe that from the beginning at the end of the Cold War, going back to Bush Sr., the Clinton administration, up to the present, and from Yeltsin forward to the two Putin terms with Medvedev in between, on neither side have leaders probably recognized what the real stakes are in U.S.-Russia relations. Or to the degree to which they have, they've not articulated it for you and me the constituencies that are necessary to mobilize behind them. What are they? I'm gonna start first of all with the nuclear sphere. There are today more than 16,000 nuclear weapons in the world. More than 16,000 nuclear weapons in the world. That's many fewer than at the height of the Cold War when there were 70,000 nuclear weapons been reduced. 92% of the 16,000 16, nuclear weapons are possessed in roughly equal share by the United States and Russia. In both of those countries, between 800 and 900 of those nuclear weapons, whether it's the US side or whether it's the Russia side, are on prompt alert or regular alert, which means they're ready for launch on warning. And the warning time for a nuclear launch is basically three minutes. That's the period in which those that are watching uh, 
are making a diagnosis or, or making a judgment that will be passed to the White House, and then the single decision maker on the U.S. side acts, and that single decision maker is the president. He has roughly 12 minutes to make a decision whether he lets the 800 or 900 missiles fly. Those missiles, for the most part, either have a warhead of 100 uh, kiloton, which is the equivalent of 100,000 TNT, that a 100 kiloton warhead is roughly nine times the size of the warhead that was used to decimate uh, Hiroshima in 1945, or a warhead, there's about 50% of them of this, of 300 kiloton. That's almost 25 times the size of the warhead that decimated Hiroshima. This is a map that was done a few years ago by FEMA, which is the Federal Emergency Management Agency, on the likely target area for a Soviet and subsequently a Russian missile attack on the United States. The black dots are an attack by 2,000 warheads, and that's larger than anything that one would imagine even in an all-out nuclear war today. But I don't know how well you can see the map. There are a lot of triangles on it, and uh, if the colors don't come through within those triangles are red dots, and those are with 500 nuclear warheads. Um, and uh, you can see what happens where you live. You can see what happens where you live in these circumstances. Now, the point is not merely that these weapons exist uh, and in the, with the implications that I just summarized, but at the current moment, all, all of the, both of the major nuclear powers, Russia and the United States, but now the other nuclear powers, because this is no longer a two-sided nuclear relationship with allies like France and Britain or an outlier like China with nuclear weapons. This is now a multipolar nuclear world with nine nuclear weapons possessing states, five of which will determine when and whether a nuclear weapon is used. Because in addition to the United States and Russia, there is China, Pakistan, and India. And in several contexts, the U.S. with China in other contexts, India with Pakistan with a China dimension, and all of them are in the process of modernizing their nuclear forces. In the case of the United States and Russia, Russia has a head start in this, of modernizing all three legs of what's called the triad, nuclear weapons on land, at sea, and in air. We are planning to spend $1.2 trillion over the next three decades in modernizing those weapons, and the Russians, as I've said, are already in the process of doing that. Uh, this is the Russian Sarmat. The Russian Sarmat is a missile that will be deployed. It's their new large ICBM. It will be deployed beginning probably in 2021. Uh, 46 of them, which will be the core of their ICBM force, their land-based force, each of these contain between 10 and 15 missiles, 15 lighter um, uh, warheads, nuclear warheads, uh, otherwise 10, and they are in that 100 to more than 300 kiloton range. And we're in the process of modernizing a force. Our current existing force is, is, this, is at, this is what we have at sea. This is called a Trident 2D5 missile. Uh, and it's, the warheads are being modernized, and uh, I don't want to get too far down into the weeds, but there's a new low-yield nuclear weapon that's to be put on them. Uh, they are on submarines. This submarine is an Ohio class. It carries 24 of them, and each one of these missiles has, has that's a low number. Each has up to 12 warheads. Uh, they will... They, they, at this point, carry roughly two-thirds of the nuclear forces that we would deliver against Russia were we to do that. But that's only the beginning of the story of modernizing because the other powers, too, all five of them, Pakistan, India, and China, are in the process now, in the case of the last three, of creating triads. So we're going to have not just two triad countries, but we're going to have five. And they're engaged, all of them now, in a new offense-defense competition because they're all building ballistic missile defense systems as we are, having walked away from the ABM agreement in 2001. They're in the process of crossing new frontiers where 
integrating nuclear will be with cyber warfare. Cyber warfare that's capable of potentially damaging control, command and control over nuclear weapons, or maybe even the use of the nuclear weapons themselves. New conventional strategic strike weapons that can perform the mission of nuclear weapons, including attacking the other side's nuclear weapons. All of them are engaged in this, beginning with the United States and Russia, and adding China, and then at a lower level, China uh, or Pakistan in India. So we now live in a multi-sided, multifarious nuclear war, a nuclear world, uh, with advances across the board, and at a time when we, be, we should be struggling with ways by which we can manage it, by which we can reduce the dangers of it. Uh, and I would interrupt the point I'm making right now to say that um, this afternoon I read a comment by Renata Dwan, who is the director of the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, who said, the dangers of nuclear weapons being used today are greater than any time since World War II. That means greater than Cuban Missile Crisis, greater than Berlin Crisis, greater than the October 73 war. Bill Perry, the former Secretary of Defense, has been saying some time that we are either in or moving into a period where the risk of nuclear use in a nuclear war is greater than any peak crisis moment during the Cold War. That's Perry's estimate. So rather than moving in the direction of managing this changing world, which I go back to one of the early, the, the early figures that I gave you, that world in which the United States and Russia still have 92% of the weapons, and unless they assume leadership, there's not going to be leadership in managing this. And instead of moving in that direction, in the context of a new Cold War, we are dismantling the arms control that we created over 50 years before. The one remaining is the new START agreement. It expires in 2021, and there's a good chance that it will not be renewed at that point. That's the consequence of, of new Cold War in the nuclear sphere. So affordable wreckage? Affordable wreckage? I don't think so. I don't think so. Second category, European security. When the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union collapsed, Leaders across this world, whether it was Helmut Kohl in Germany or Jacques Chirac in France or Bush, George Bush Sr. in the United States and then Bill Clinton or Boris Yeltsin, all talked about creating now in this new environment with its opportunity a Euro-Atlantic security community that would extend across North America, Europe and into Eurasia. At the time, the language was a Euro-Atlantic security community from Vancouver to Vladivostok. And they repeated that. It's not an ivory tower idea. These were the leaders of countries within this region. They repeated that idea at least as late as 2010 at an international conference that addressed these kinds of questions, uh, the issue of security in Europe. What did they mean by a security community across these territories? They meant first it would be uh, among countries that had conflicts of interest inevitably, uh, maybe that led to tensions, uh, these conflicts of interest would not be addressed by the use of force or even the threatened use of force. And the emphasis would be to concentrate on a common security agenda because goodness knows in the 21st century all of the countries, North America, Europe, Eurasia face a considerable uh, common security agenda, uh, and we can all recognize that. But instead of that, rather than moving toward a Euro-Atlantic security community from Vancouver to Vladivostok, Vladivostok, which would make this region, this critical region, uh, an, important, uh, an important area of stability in a global environment which is scarcely stable, from the Middle East to Africa to Latin America, now to East Asia, we're in the process of recreating a military confrontation in Europe with a new central front that's been moved to the east from the Elba River to the Boog River uh, and preparing to deal with it in those terms. This is a picture of Russian forces preparing for a military exercise in September 
of 2017. The exercise is called Zapad 2017. Zapad, the, the Russian word for West. This was directed against NATO. This is the way in which they began training for it. With all of these effects, this is Zapad 2017. Uh, and where we are in terms of what's become an utter fantasy at this point of a Euro-Atlantic security community from Vancouver to Vladivostok. And NATO has been responding with its own exercises in response. Uh, NATO will run 102 exercises this year in order to deal with what we see as a growing Russian threat. That's the NATO response, which I meant to get to. This is NATO response. This is NATO. This is what we're doing now. Instead of Euro-Atlantic security community from Vancouver to Vladivostok. Um, last week, a colleague of mine that's been working with us on the project that Philip mentioned at the beginning at the American Academy on meeting the challenges of this new multipolar nuclear world, uh, a colleague who's a senior figure out at Lawrence Livermore, uh, was in London at King's College in a war game in which the Ukrainian crisis is heated up. This is now the second stage of the game. Uh, and there's been an escalation of Russian intervention in Ukraine, uh, Western involvement in the Black Sea. The Russians have just, have just sunk an Aegis uh, uh, destroyer in the Baltic Sea. That's part of our ballistic missile defense system in Europe and shot down a Turkish uh, reconnaissance aircraft, which would be a NATO aircraft. And the game they played at that point was what happens next within this context. But this is what we're preparing for. Uh, affordable damage? Affordable damage? I don't think so. Third, in the geostrategic tectonic uh, 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 plates that are shifting in international politics today, none is more important than the rise of China and what's going to happen in the US-China relationship. That's going to be the major bilateral relationship of this century, it already is. For the last 10 years, I would argue, it has been poised rather perilously on a narrow strip or knife's edge, if you will, between on the one hand, the economic interdependence, the intertwining of the economy, the importance of each, of each for the other in the economic sphere, and at the, on the other side, a growing concern with what are the military aspirations, efforts, uh, and uh, activities of the other side, the distensions around South China Sea, uh, and always the issue of Taiwan and the U.S.-China relationship. Well, at the moment, the real risk is that it's beginning to tilt in the direction of strategic rivalry. I was in Moscow, I, one of the, I think it was the third or the fourth trip ago uh, last fall, and I was in the office of a friend of mine, uh, Andrei Kokoshin, who's the director of the International Relations Department at Moscow State University. He's a former deputy minister of defense in the Yeltsin period, and he was national security advisor. And in the course of the conversation, he said there had just been a Chinese delegation in his office, five people from the Chinese Central Committee. He was surprised because they seem now to be much warmer toward the notion of Russia and China cooperating, Russia needing, uh, uh, China needing Russia in this context, whether in the way one thought what was the senior and junior relationship historically, because the Chinese were saying to him, look, we thought the economic relationship with the United States was essentially a counterbalance to where things were going militarily and on the security side. It would balance out. But now, this is a year ago, so the, the talk of trade war and what was, what's now happening at the current moment was already in the air. But they said, now we're, we don't know. We don't know what to think. We now fear that that economic dimension may be reinforcing of the other side and that we are engaging in economic war at the same time that the security concerns are increasing. Well, what will a world of a new Cold War between the United States and China, even if it doesn't lead to war, the firing of guns, but simply the competition, uh, including the arms race and the other things, at the same time that we're engaged in a new Cold War with Russia, and pushing the two together rather than finding a way by which the United States and Russia can cooperate in what should be our separate but mutual interest, 
to integrate China constructively into the international system? What if we approach the rise of China and the US-China relationship competitively with Russia in this context? Uh, well, the last slide I'll show you is this. I showed you a moment ago a slide of Zapad 2017, West for NATO and the training. This is the exercise last September. This is Vostok 2018. Vostok is the Russian word for East. This was done in the East, 300,000 Russian troops. But if you look at the middle flag, what flag is that? They were cooperating in the, in the, um, in the exercise. Um, affordable wreckage? That, that's, that's not a country's flag. That uh, has to be uh, from the military units. Um, historically, as a flag, it was uh, the Greek flag in the Ottoman Empire, but uh, it's not a contemporary flag in international politics. Um, there's a version of it, um, which is the, the Laotian flag, but it's not quite the, the three stripes and their vertical stripes. But in any event, the two national stripes are the Russian flag and the Chinese, the Chinese flag. So again, my question, affordable wreckage? I don't think so. And time is drawing short. I want to get to that fifth question and deal with it briefly. So I would only identify two other critical areas, climate change and the resource conflicts that it's going to generate in the future. Russia is, as the United States, one of the four largest greenhouse gas emitters internationally. And what's happening, Russia, under the impact of climate change, particularly in the north, uh, and then into the Arctic region is severe and needs to be dealt with by not only Russia, but Russia cooperating with the international community and certainly the other Arctic nations, including the United States. We have been cooperating on many issues in the Arctic. It's been one of the, up to this point, partial exceptions to the new Cold War, and it was even when the relationships were up and down in that earlier period, that what I called neither fish nor fowl, friend or foe, uh, that period I call useful ambiguity in the relationship. The useful ambiguity is gone now. But during that period of time, there was more cooperation. Now we're in the process, all parties, in militarizing the Arctic, securitizing it, and on the Russian side, extending it as part of those exercises that you saw in Zapa 2017, rather than dealing with climate change um, cooperatively, particularly the Russian component of it, uh, and any of you in the, in the room, as I assume many of you, are aware that uh, the effects of climate change are going to be early and most effective and most, uh, most substantial coming from the Arctic itself. So rather than increase cooperation in this area uh, under the context, in the context of the new Cold War, which literally prevents us in all these areas from cooperation, we're not, uh, we're not producing that affordable wreckage. Third, uh, fifth, I think, and finally, uh, what I would call the dark side or the underside of new technologies. Uh, the dark side or the underside of artificial intelligence or cyber in the larger sense of machine learning, quantum com uh, computing, or bioengineering, or dealing with health pandemics and the like. The major players have to cooperate they have to cooperate in dealing with the underside, the black side of these technologies. Russia and the United States are two of the major players in each of these areas. Cold War prevents any talk of significant cooperation in the area. Again, creates that uh, impediment, that block at a basic level. Affordable wreckage, I don't think so. So I finish with some thoughts about uh, this question of if it matters, as you can see, I believe it does, what should be done? Uh, and I will, I'll point to, uh, I'll point to four general things. Um, there isn't time now to go into the detail that would miss, so that's a separate lecture in itself. The first, the first thing that I would say is I think we ought to entertain the possibility that the, that the André Gide formula is a better one than the Mondrian painting. That is that the color of truth is gray and that indeed the Russian challenge is a complex one. 
uh, and product of circumstance and events uh, rather than what we assume is the impulse for Russian foreign policy behavior. That is, there is a general assumption in the Mondrian painting, in the mainstream, that is Washington, the media, and the expert community, and then the counterpart in Moscow. It's, it's the same, if not, if not harder core along these lines, that Russia is driven, uh, foreign policy is agenda driven. That it goes back to what Putin said in 2005, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century. And our assumption is that he's in the process of uh, correcting or rectifying that tragedy. And he's prepared to do that in aggrandizing Russia by reconstituting as much of what they had before as possible. That's what Ukraine is about. That's what the aggression is about. And that aggrandizing impulse on Russia's part, he's prepared to execute elsewhere, uh, whether it's in the Baltic or in northern Kazakhstan or wherever else. Um, the alternative view would be that uh, these are not mutually exclusive. They obviously both can be at play. It's a question of the proportions and which is dominant. Uh, is that Russian foreign policy is event-driven. That doesn't make it benevolent. It doesn't make it positive, but it makes it different. And by event-driven, give you a concrete illustration. The assumption of the grab, the illicit, illegal grab of Crimea, by the first view, agenda-driven was they were just waiting for the opportunity to seize Crimea. That was the agenda. And when the opportunity occurred in February, March of 2014, they acted. And they were prepared to do that. The event-driven says that Putin is sitting back watching what's happening in Ukraine during the events of the Maidan. And he's saying that essentially what's going to come out of this is a Ukraine that is basically hostile to Russia. Russia has done its part in order to generate that hostility. A Ukraine that's hostile to Russia, that will be moving closer to NATO, whether sooner or later, and NATO will then be moving into the Black Sea region where our fleet is deployed, and Crimea, which the U Ukrainians control at this point of view, uh, and I'm going to act in order to prevent that. And the same thing can be said about a whole host of other issues, including I'll save it for our conversation afterwards, if you wish, uh, the Russian approach to election interfering and what they've been doing in our election and other elections or Syria or any of these other cases. Is it agenda driven or is it primarily event driven in the way in which they react? If it's the latter, as I say, it becomes more malleable. It depends on circumstances. It depends on where events go. Uh, and therefore, uh, an important um, implication for U.S. policy is rather than attempting to control Russian behavior, you attempt to shape the events that affect Russian behavior in a certain way. Second of the four points would be that we need to re-engage Russia rather than what we're doing now, keeping Russia at arm's length, isolating it to the extent that we can, punishing it with layer after layer of sanctions, and uh, now, as I say, beginning to build our defenses as they build their defenses to deal with one another. Engaging Russia means, from my point of view, uh, attempting a strategic dialogue where the two sides sit down and try to get at what are the basic impulses of behavior. That's, again, not a purely ivory tower idea. We have, been, we have done strategic dialogue with the Soviet Union Russia in the past. The Bush Jr. administration had what I would regard as almost a model strategic dialogue with, uh, with Putin's Russia in 2003 in the, in the months immediately after the Iraq war. Again, I won't take the time now to go into the detail of that. And this administration, the Trump administration, has played, particularly when Tillerson was Secretary of State, with the idea of strategic dialogue, but they can't get it done. They can't get it done or under, un launched under the impact of a Cold War. We're in a very deep hole and we're still digging and we don't know how to stop digging in Moscow or in Washington. But part of that business of uh, carrying out a, a, a dialogue would be to restore some level of mutual respect between the two sides. Even in the harshest moments of the Cold War, there was a level of mutual respect. Henry Kissinger said, I think quite wisely, 
when we went over the cliff at the beginning of the Ukrainian crisis, the demonization of Putin is not a policy. It's an alibi for the absence of a policy. Um, third point, from a strategic point of view, I would return to where NATO was in 1967, a year before the Czech crisis, when NATO decided the right way to deal with the Soviet Union was a two-track policy that was detente and deterrence. Detente and deterrence. Right now, our policy is essentially deterrence. And we need a strategy that has a balanced two-track approach. Engaging Russia, as I've just said, strategic dialogue, looking for common ground where it may be, trusting that it may be feasible to do so because we don't assume that um, Putin and the regime is utterly irredeemable, which is the underlying assumption of current U.S. policy and within mainstream views. Uh, and adjusting tactics in the same way, uh, carrots and sticks. The sticks, from my point of view, rather than being used only negatively at this point, we should be thinking about ways in which they can be used positively. That is, the sanctions that we've applied, and we've applied them willy-nilly, primarily the Congress, uh, going back to the summer of 2014, the Ukrainian crisis, but then layering on, on Syria, and then layering on uh, what was happening in Syria. And then on top of that, of course, election interference and two or three other things. At this point, the sanctions are punishing Russia for, I think, five different forms of behavior. And there's no one in Moscow that could figure out uh, what behavior, even if they wish to and they don't, to change in order to satisfy those sanctions. But I would, I would be much more thoughtful tactically about how I use those sanctions. And I try to create positive incentives. It would be essentially, you do the following small step in order to improve the situation in Ukraine and Donbass or over gas relations between Russia and Ukraine and we will lift this set of sanctions. Or in the military area, yes, we're gonna build defense, but the other side of that will also be, we want to strengthen what limited and failing arms control we still have in Europe. The, Via, the Vienna document of 2011, which provides for monitoring and transparency, advance notice of, of maneuvers, or the open skies agreement that exists, or something in addition to that. So that we're doing both things with, as I say, the carrots and the sticks in pursuit of a detente deterrence. Uh, outlet. And then the last point, and I'll stop. Um, we're not going to, as I say, get, as I've suggested, get out of this hole that we're digging and where we continue to dig with a single stroke of a sword cutting a Gordian knot. We got here through a series of steps, missteps, and we're only going to get out with a series of probably small steps that move in the direction of, uh, of slowly scraping away the layers of mistrust that the two sides have created over this period of time. Um, as I said, all of these items need to be spelled out, and I have a way of spelling them out, but I've already taken too much of your time this evening. There are a number of small steps that could be taken even now. And I think parts of the Trump administration are wrestling with that. It seemed to be sort of the message that didn't come across in the Western media of Pompeo's meeting with uh, Lavrov and Putin in Sochi uh, 10 days ago, that they may be looking for some of those things, even though the basic attitude, particularly within the State Department now, is very negative, very hard line on the Russian, the assumptions. It is very much the, 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 the Mondrian painting right now in the circumstances. But without going into that detail, I'd finish by saying that I think all of these issues are worth thinking about and that we re-examine that question of whether this is affordable wreckage when we raise our eyes to what are the real stakes in U.S.-Russia relations that we have not understood and we've not been led to understand by administration after administration, by Russian leadership after Russian leadership. So, Philip, whatever time we have, I'm happy to talk about this, respond to questions. Thank you. I was just wondering if you feel that much of Putin's 
saber rattling and, and taking over small pieces of neighboring countries are to hide Russia's um, financial problems, um, their economy, so that he can put that in the background and, and appear to be the big hero? It's a good question, and it's it's a question. Uh, <coughs> this was I didn't infer this was uh, what lay a little lay behind the question itself, but it is the assumption in Washington or elsewhere that that indeed is a primary motivation for him that he's attempting to distract attention. His popularity is declining in Russia, which by that by that line of reason would argue that Russia is increasingly dangerous uh, at this point, if that's the case. My answer is again on Rajid. I think the color of truth is gray. I think it's a mix of things. There's no question that Crimea has been a political factor for him. And that when economic dynamism that existed within Russia after 2008 began to falter as a basis for popular support, or if you will, legitimacy of the regime, there was a resort to a kind of crude nationalism when I walked around Moscow, young people were wearing t-shirts that said, Krim Nash, Crimea is ours. And that worked, that resonated, still does. Uh, the seizure and the incorporation uh, of uh, Crimea is still very popular within Russia. So that's in part. But the other part of Crimea or of the saber rattling at this point which I think is reckless and foolish on his part, which is in the likes, like many of the things that he does that works for him in the short term, politically and even in aspects of foreign policy, in the long run will be counterproductive. Uh, again, I think showing that Russia is strong and this notion of derzhavnost, great power, we're entitled to it, uh, is not just a Putin idea. This, as I say, is through Russian history and it resonates with the public as such. Now, his popularity is no longer, if you say what his popularity is in this country, compared to in this country, you would think he's doing pretty well. It's in the low 60s at this point. But it has been as high as in the 80s. Uh, and the issues that you raise have been an important part of that. And he's very, very sensitive, uh, despite the authoritarianism within the regime. He's very sensitive to what his standing is within the public. There is uh, Bill Burns, the outstanding U.S. diplomat who was Deputy Secretary of State, Under Secretary of State, and an ambassador, one of the best ambassadors we've had in Russia or the Soviet Union in the last half century, has described in this new memoir that he's written, Back Channel, he's described Russia as being, uh, as being cranky, aggrieved, and insecure. And he's got one other adjective that I've now forgotten. That's pretty accurate. One of the things I heard was that the Crimea grab was partly to a strategic move to get a warm water port in terms of Sevastopol. And uh, a lot of the way that Russia has gained, I think, a lot of traction is by the cyber warfare approach, which is a lot cheaper and a lot less visible than the great missile parades and uh, tank... Uh, assemblages of tanks and weapons like that. So I think we as a country need to focus very much on the efficiency of that and try to, in a major way, uh, to uh, stem it. Well, is this, is this functioning? No. no. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I don't, I don't think the uh, on the first part of the point, your first point, the Crimea as a as a uh, warm water port that Russia thought was really much of an impulse in this context because in fact they have fundamentally warm water ports and they're going to have an increasing number of them with climate change in the Arctic. Uh, but it was there was a negative side to it. They didn't want that port, those ports around Sevastopol and the related city where the where the Black Sea fleet which is still primarily a Russian fleet, uh, was deployed with the assumption that not only would they lose the port and the facilities, but that uh, um, at some point NATO would come to occupy them. Uh, on, the, on the more basic point about cyber, in the context of the point that you really are making, that Russia has now uh, 
on the cheap engage in what's called hybrid warfare or nonlinear warfare, which is everything from from uh, information warfare to election interference, uh, the spreading of disinformation using social media, all the rest of it in our country and in Europe now on the eve of the European parliamentary elections. That's what that's that's what Russia is doing. We need to awaken to that. We need to prepare ourselves to deal with it. I think that's true. Uh, the problem is that this is now a universe that's not exclusively Russian as a problem or a problem maker. This is now international. And we need, uh, as, as uh, major players, we're doing a fair amount of it ourselves, or we're certainly developing a capability of doing it. The Chinese are doing it in a more subtle way. It focuses primarily on intellectual property. Uh, industrial espionage, military and otherwise. Uh, but the Chinese are doing it at the Russian style level in the Australian relationship. It may not affect the US, but it affects the Australians. The Iranians are doing it. Uh, a series of other powers can do it. So we're gonna have to figure out ways by which we, I don't know, create codes of conduct. But I suspect that here, the defense side is going to be the most important part. We're going to need to figure out how we defend ourselves against it, even on an issue like election interference. I parse that issue of what the Russians did in the 2016 election, and from what I understand they're currently doing, maybe headed toward the 2020 election. I think it's four parts. There is the propaganda that comes through Russian radio and television, RT and Sputnik and so on. They would argue it's what we're doing with Radio Free Europe or Radio Liberty or the like, whether that's a fair comparison is another matter. I see that at the low end of the pyramid or the totem pole. The next is the extent to which they engaged in uh, cyber hacking in order to acquire information, hacking into the DNC or the New York Times or the Olympic health records or whatever else they did. Uh, and then the third level, this is in ascending order of importance, is the exploitation of social media and using what they hacked into, using a Wikipedia in order to, to, in order to distribute information, but even more than that, using uh, social media in order to spread disinformation among our public in order to try to accentuate, I'll not say create because it already exists, but to accentuate the polarization and fights and tribalism within our political system. But the fourth and the most serious thing is where they did some testing in the 16 election and that uh, their ability to uh, jimmy the electoral process itself. That is acquire access to electronic poll books or registration lists in order to delegitimize a vote itself uh, so that the vote count could be seen as corrupted. Now, the way I would go about this problem is starting at the top, and I'd say really what we want cut immediately and completely is that last stage. That is a national security threat. Dianne Feinstein put it in those terms. If you delegitimize an American election, quite apart from trying to fire up various portions of the electorate with disinformation, but if you delegitimize an election, that is a threat very threat to the core of our political system, and that can't go on. That's new because of the technology that you point to. The Soviet Union always wanted to interfere in our domestic politics and tried to, but they didn't have the technology to do that fourth level, and even a large part of that third level. Uh, so that's the way I would work the problem, uh, and the extent to which, I mean, we're capable of doing the same thing. One of the things that the Obama administration had done in the last months um, uh, was uh, instruct agencies to explore the possibility of planting what are called cyber bombs. That is, we would be able to implant uh, malware and other things within critical structure within Russia that at a critical point, if we wanted to, we could ignite them. We're in the process of exploring that process as well. Again, I come back to the notion that this is now a generalized problem, uh, and it would be very good if we had U.S. and Russian, but that won't be enough, U.S. and Russian cooperation in trying to deal with it. But once more, my point, in a new Cold War, we can't get to it. We can't even begin doing it. I won't go on that long with the other questions, but that's a very important question that you're asking. Simply, what Russia's uh, response, or if they're nervous about, or whatever, China's Belt and Road Initiatives, 
I know they're coming near Kazakhstan and things like that, so maybe there's an effect. The Belt and Road um, um, project for China, which has its own range of considerations and problems along the way, and, and, um, is from a Russian point of view acceptable at this juncture. Uh, at times, Russia is a little nervous about the degree to which the Chinese are penetrating areas like Central Asia economically. Uh, that's broader than simply Belt and Road uh, as, an, as an issue. Um, although that's counterbalanced by the fact that the Chinese have been generally quite deferential to the Russians in terms of their standing in place, uh, role as security provider within the Central Asian context. So the Chinese have been um, quite careful about the extent to which they ruffle uh, 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 ruffle uh, Russian feathers on any of these things. But in terms of Belt and Road itself, which uh, if you've been following, you know, has a number of dimensions, including there is now even an Arctic dimension. Belt and Road, they're thinking about the Northern Passage into the Arctic as part of Belt and Road. The Chinese have a heavy stake in the Northern Passage uh, for obvious reasons, and also in the resources of the Arctic. And the Russians are very jealous of their position within this region, but they have more or less signed off on it. And the fundamental, the fundamental uh, element in the relationship is that the Russians with the Chinese have reached agreements, and they talk about it and they praise it, for integrating the Russian integration project in the Eurasian area. It's called the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, it's supposed to be a kind of counterbalance to the Euro European economic uh, community uh, or the European Union. Uh, this now for the, the post-Soviet space, again, the Eurasian economic community. It's a Russian project with post-Soviet states. Uh, and they have worked out an agreement by which they will try to integrate steps in the one with steps in the other. Uh, and uh, for the time being, I think that is, is uh, going to mean that this is more a basis for comedy between the two, question, the two countries rather than competition. Uh, but there are some uneasy sides to this. There's no question about it. what it'll mean in the long run because there's still a question of whether Belt and Road is going to be ultimately successful in itself, let alone the Eurasian Economic Union, which uh, looks like it has a lot of problems. So it's not clear that all of these trends are straightforward and will simply go ahead. But uh, for the moment, I would argue that the Chinese and the, and the Russians are more or less on the same page. And it is back in that larger context that I raised the what I call the geostrategic tectonic plates that are shifting and the risk of U.S.-China strategic rivalry in the context of a U.S.-Russian Cold War. Again, uh, in, this, in this instance, uh, basically what you're seeing is that, that Russia and China see one another as today their most important partners in foreign policy. They're not willing to form an alliance against the United States. Neither can afford to do that in the present circumstance. The only one that can produce a Russia-Chinese alliance against the United States is the United States. We can produce that. But if, uh, if things continue as they are, the parallelism in Russian and Chinese foreign policy in many areas, this being one of them, but in many areas, whether it has to do with Tibet, or Chechnya, or Taiwan, or U.S. security relations with Japan, or any of the other issues along the way, arms sales to Taiwan, Russia and China are like this on foreign policy. Well, actually, they basically are on board. Uh, their north, as you may know, is, is a mess. Uh, and at this point, as the permafrost softens, it is releasing methane gases that are having a very deleterious, potentially very deleterious effect in the north. Uh, and beyond, uh, I think the China, I think the Russians on a on a uh, at a national level uh, are willing to certainly take help, material help, in dealing with the problem of climate change in that area. Uh, so I don't think there is a natural uh, that there's a natural juxtaposition or conflict between exploiting oil and gas resources in the area. Uh, and um, and dealing with climate change. Uh, 
in the region. There are separate categories. There are basically five categories that one worries about in the Arctic uh, from the technology of uh, gas and oil exploitation and before that the legal questions of rights to the, to the oil and gas. Um, but the, the technology and the relationship to technology is what happens in the case of oil spills in that area, which will be far more difficult to deal with than oil spills that we've known in warmer climates, uh, to protecting the rights of indigenous peoples in the area and a host of other issues of that kind. So legal, um, strategic in terms of exploiting resources, dealing with climate change, dealing sociologically with the problems in the area. And across most of those categories, I would say at least three of the five, there has been essential cooperation. The fifth category is what I referred to as securitizing the area or militarizing it. Uh, and that has been on the back burner until recently. Now the Russians are refurbishing military bases and running exercises in that area and asserting uh, their control over the uh, Northern Passage as the Canadians do over the Northwest Passage, contrary to the U.S. position on the Northwest Passage. Um, but I, I would think in that context, uh, the legal issues I think are relatively easily resolved on the right to oil and gas. The question of exploiting it comes back to this question of cooperation. There was to be large-scale U.S.-Russia cooperation in developing uh, gas supplies in the Kara Sea. Uh, that all got uh, undermined or undone by the new Cold War. Uh, and I would finish by arguing that since I don't see a natural conflict between Russia's interest in developing oil and gas in the region and at the same time attending to uh, environmental degradation leading to uh, accentuating climate change problems, uh, that the cooperation that would, uh, that would really improve the situation generally across these categories, uh, again, is impeded by a new Cold War. Uh, there has been an argument that the Arctic is the one region that has, that has uh, escaped the effects of the new Cold War. Uh, and I think, given what I've just been saying, one of the tests over the next year or two, if we continue to dig the hole deeper, is whether or not the contamination of the Cold War that's being waged in Europe and in the nuclear sphere and in all of these other areas will not begin to bleed into the Arctic more substantially. And then it'll really make cooperation on these issues um, uh, difficult, if not impossible. Uh, it's very brief. Do we have the strength of the voices in Washington who can really make an impact to help bring some sanity in this whole situation? What hope is there that that the Mondrian painting will be um, complicated in the future by politicians either uh, in government, you're speaking primarily of Congress. Um, I, I, right now my view would be that the Congress is an important part of the problem in US-Russia relations. Uh, and it's a problem from all directions. Uh, it's a problem because uh, a, there are no longer the thoughtful foreign policy entrepreneurs that provided leadership within the Congress on this issue. I'm thinking of a Dick Lugar or a Sam, Sam Nunn um, or in the House a series of other individuals. They're all, they're all missing at this point. There is no new Dick Lugar. There is no new Sam Nunn within Senate or otherwise. Secondly, on the Republican side, so far as there has been leadership, it tends to be an extension of what was the original um, Cold War hawk side of things uh, that really did see Russia uh, as a threat and a challenge along the lines of the Mondrian painting, determined to destroy the rule-based international order, determined to undermine U.S. policy everywhere by any means uh, along the line. And they continue to exercise considerable influence uh, in partnership with what is basically a liberal and moderate set of democratic voices. Democratic voices that historically have been in favor of engaging Russia and in favor of detente when there were opportunities for that in the Soviet period uh, and even strong supporters of transforming the U.S.-Russia relationship during the Yeltsin period. 
Uh, I'm thinking about senators like Sherrod Brown or the new senator, Gene Shaheen in New Hampshire, or Christopher Murphy in Connecticut, uh, or in, at, at times, Dianne Feinstein. All of them have believed in that alternative approach. Indeed, the one I referred to in 1967 of detente, deterrence, and the like. But they are so preoccupied with the issue of Russian interference in our election that that has become a prerequisite for every other issue. So they are the leading sponsors of wave after wave of sanctions. Uh, and not thinking about the way in which you use sanctions in an alternative way. The one promising aspect of that is the voices that I've just described, and I think broadly within a democratically controlled house, including Anna Adam Smith, who chairs the Armed Services Committee, is at this point a, a glimmer of a recognition that angry as we are at the Russians, and rightfully so for the election interference, as much as it's important to punish them and pillory them and attempt to force their hand until they cry uncle around the sanctions on, on the uh, interference issue. Nonetheless, arms control in the nuclear sphere needs to be separated out. We need to move in that direction. So you do have sentiment within the Democratic Party, for example, that New START that's scheduled to expire February 2021 has a clause in it that it can be renewed for five years. And the Russians have been saying, we ought to do it now, because in another year you'll be in an election period and there'll be no chance of doing it. The administration has been pressured to, at this point, accept that invitation and to extend new starts. So we've got at least a five-year grace period where the current, uh, uh, the current arrangement and new start exists and we can hope that within that period of time we can get back on track. Um, much of the Democratic Party is in favor of that. A strong voice that's the exception to what I've been saying uh, about moderate, <coughs> about modern Democrats, excuse me, <coughs> is Ed Markey. And Markey has understood the nuclear issues from the beginning uh, and is very concerned with what we're doing at the moment. Uh, he's concerned about that 12-minute decision-making time for the eight to 900 warheads in the hands of a president. And he and, and Congressman Liu from Hawaii have introduced, and others have introduced legislation that are trying to undo our system that leaves the president as the only person who can launch a nuclear attack and introduce Congress into that. That, quite frankly, uh, for people in, in, in this business, is a non-starter because it, it, it completely destroys the notion of, of what you want in a nuclear deterrent, how you think about it as long as you have the weapons. But it is a sign of the times and it is a measure about what the concerns are at the moment. And I go back to, uh, I go back to Bill Perry's point. Chances of nuclear weapons being fired now or soon greater than at any time during peak crisis moments. The fact that almost all of us have spent the last 20 years forgetting about nuclear weapons, part because our grandchildren are not ducking under their desks or doing whatever they need to do for civil defense preparations the way we did when we were in grade school, has allowed people to forget the issue. And I, the other, I'd finish with this, the other discouraging note uh, was the Armed Services Committee has taken up this question of what kind of a nuclear posture we need to have. Uh, and this modernization, this $1.2 trillion uh, bill for modernizing all three legs of the triad, do we need to do all aspects of it, particular weapons programs? Adam Smith, who's opposed to doing a number of these things, has done the first set of hearings on big questions about our approach to nuclear weapons. Uh, and if you go back and look at those hearings, the committee, and this is a portion of the House that really should understand these issues on both sides, Democrats and Republicans, were incredibly ignorant about nuclear weapons. There were people on that committee that didn't, didn't even know what a triad is. And the other kinds of questions that they asked reflected the kind of ignorance at this stage that reflects the lapse in attention to this issue uh, during the uh, period since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Well, you've been very patient. Thank you um, for thank, being here. Thank you very much.